Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Roger W. Knight, and we're having another installment on the issues of uh, police policy and criminal justice. Now, this time, we're going to discuss the matter of police honesty. The importance of uh, police being honest in their performance of their duties, and how that can improve the criminal justice system in that a higher percentage of those who commit crimes will be found guilty and pay the penalty for those crimes, and a lower percentage of those who are actually uh, convicted will be innocent persons. We don't want innocent people to be uh, hurt by the criminal justice system. And we all have an interest in that. Now you might say, well, how can I assail the honesty of police? They have a difficult job. They are first responders. They are heroes. Uh, they're the thin blue line that stands between us and utter chaos of the, cr of the criminals and of disorder. And while that's all true, I would submit to you that mere fact that a job is tough or difficult doesn't make those who have that job necessarily more honest or less honest than anyone else. I mean, there's lots of tough jobs. Coal mining, truck driving, uh, dairy farming, cattle punching. <laughs> cattle ranching there's lots of tough jobs out there but the thing is is that mere fact that you perform a tough job doesn't necessarily mean that you are a better person or a worse person than other people who work in air-conditioned offices for example so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the condition situation of say a public defender or a defense lawyer who is assigned a case involving state versus Jack Wagoner and he gets to represent the defendant Jack Wagon. Jack Wagon is charged with a crime and well there you go. So as an attorney representing Jack Wagon, uh, you file your notice of appearance with the court and you file your request for discovery from the prosecutor, standard request, and the prosecutor sends you the uh, discovery package and you look through the package and you see two police reports. One of them is authored by Stone Wallingford See? And his partner, Officer Juanita Kirkland. And you look at these uh, files and you get a gist of the case against uh, your client, Jack Wagoner. And indeed, you can go interview your client over at the jailhouse if he's still in custody. Or if he's out of custody, you can ask him to come into your office and he comes into your office. And uh, here is... Jack Wagon, your client. And, uh, well, he is very insistent on being innocent of the crime. He's saying, man, I did not commit this crime. And I want to get before the jury. I will tell the jury everything that happened and convince them that I did not commit this crime. There's no way I could have committed this crime. And you look at the evidence and says, well, yeah, you know, maybe there's a defense here. Maybe you can win. But, uh... One of the things you got to deal with is, is that juries tend to give beautiful uh, men in police uniforms and beautiful women in police uniforms a lot of credibility. And uh, while some uh, defendants uh, are handsome men and handsome women, and some defendants can exude a great deal of credibility, uh, Jack Wagon isn't one of them, you know, and that's just the fact. He might, that doesn't mean he's guilty of the crime, and doesn't mean that the evidence can prove it beyond reasonable doubt, but the reality is, is that if you're just going to go into a credibility contest between him and the police, yeah, well, he might become a guest of the Department of Corrections for a while. So your job as his lawyer is to try to prevent that from happening. And that's the thing, is, is that when it comes to uh, credibility, you got the primary jury instruction. You are the sole judges of the credibility of the witnesses and how much weight to give each witness's testimony. So if they give uh, Officer Juanita Kirkland's testimony and Officer Stone Wallingford's testimony more credibility than your client's testimony, that might not work out for you. 
and your for your client. So the thing is, is that how then do you attack the credibility of the police officers who will be witnesses against your client? Because they are are that. But if there's not a lot of uh, other evidence in the case other than the testimony of the police officers, you might have an opportunity there to win the case. But how can you do it? Well, there is an evidence rule that has that bears on that. And it's evidence rule 608B. And it's about specific instances of conduct. But there's a limit to what they can you can do with these specific instances of conduct. I'll read the rule for you. You know, you, you can see that. Specific instance of conduct. Specific instance of conduct of a witness for the purpose of attacking or supporting the witness's credibility, other than conviction of crime as provided by Rule 609, may not be proved by extrinsic evidence. Whatever, what's extrinsic evidence? Well, you know, that's probably why you're not a lawyer. You don't know what the heck extrinsic evidence is as opposed to other kinds of evidence. But they may, however, in the discretion of the court, <coughs> oh, sorry, in the discretion of the court, it's right there. You can look it up. If probative of truthfulness or untruthfulness, be inquired on cross-examination of the witness. You get to cross-examine your witnesses. You know, the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment and of Article One, Section 22 of the Washington Constitution. Concerning the witness's character or for truthfulness or untruthfulness. And that's the key issue. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a limitation to how you can attack the credibility of a witness like this. We have rape shield laws that are designed to keep uh, defense lawyers in rape cases from attacking the alleged victim's uh, credibility by pointing out that, well, she has had a busy sex life and such. And, and it can be very degrading. However, mere fact that she's had a busy sex life doesn't give a, a, a man any more, or, or a lesbian woman for that matter, any more right to rape her than a woman who's a virgin. It doesn't matter how busy her sex life is. You don't have the right to rape her, obviously. So I never understood why that such a, a evidence would besmirch her credibility. But Apparently, there have been nightmare cases in the past where lawyers used that tactic and were successful with it. Still, uh, innocent men are accused of rape. It does happen. And we used to lynch people on the belief that they raped. Seventy percent of the historical lynchings in the United States, and this is true of both black men who have been lynched and of white men who have been lynched, in 70 percent of the case, the motivation was the belief they raped somebody. But uh, we insist on trials nowadays. We don't lynch people anymore for such crimes. And if a alleged rape victim, if the evidence has to do with her truthfulness, if she, uh, say if she was convicted of perjury in the past, well, that would be, that would be probative. Uh, say that uh, she admitted to lying in a statement somewhere, somewhere along the line. Yeah, that's probative. To her credibility. It's just that you don't get to attack her for having been a loose woman or having had a busy sex life. You know, that's kind of neither here nor there. I mean, she could be the busiest sex life in the world, the student body at her high school, but that doesn't matter as to whether or not she was raped. I mean, you don't get to, you don't get to rape her just because she's been busy in her life. So I understand that, but there's limitations on there and such, but you still have a right on cross-examination to attack the credibility of the witness to bring up prior evidence in their lives to a certain extent. It's within the discretion of the court if it bears on credibility and the credibility of the witness is crucial to the prosecution's case. Now, there is a couple of us uh, appellate court decisions here in Washington that bear on it. And this is where the, where the judges are. You know, I'll hold this here for a moment so you can read. And one of them in 1980 in State versus York, it, the finding of the uh, Court of Appeals was where witnesses' credibility is crucial to the state's case, defense has a right on cross-examination to bring in prior matters in witness life 
that bear on his credibility. Now, I'm paraphrasing a bit what they said. Such right is constitutional under the Confrontation Clause. Here, you, you see, see the quote, and then you can go look the case up and read it for yourself. Uh, the other one that came a few years later, State versus Robinson, but not where there's corroborating evidence. In State versus Robinson, there were semen stains that corroborated the testimony of the witness, prosecution witnesses. So the jury could draw the proper inferences from the forensic evidence that was there. So it does matter, to a certain extent, how crucial the credibility of a witness is to the state's case in the eyes of the court. So you can present this type of argument and, and ask to present this type of evidence and state that in your discovery uh, response to the clerk, in your witness list, in your evidence list that you will present as attorney for the defendant, uh, evidence to, that bears on the credibility of the prosecution witness. In this case, Officer Stone Wallingford, the beautiful, uh, tall, strong, muscular uh, police officer, and his beautiful and muscular and athletic uh, partner, Juanita Kirkland. So, how do you do this? Well, one of the keys to this is the fact that these police officers wrote police reports. That's how you know that they're the prosecution witnesses in this case. You read the police reports. And I'll show you what a police report looks like. Generally speaking, here, 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 here's what they look like. And you see that uh, on the first page, we might have a uh, identification of uh, information as to witnesses and suspects and other persons involved. You have their address, their names, their date of birth, uh, the incident type is up here, uh, things like that. And then on the second page, you'll have a narrative. And these used to be all handwritten, but you know, since the uh, computer age has begun, Officers now can go to their desk, then go to their computer, and they can type it up like this, like that, and you create a printed narrative. Now, you see the advantage of having police reports like this. Uh, for the police department and for the prosecution's office, you can imagine that these are all stored up in computer files, uh, on hard drives and the like. And presumably, they'd be searchable by name of suspect, by name of officer, by date of birth, by type of incident was it uh, assault well you can you can do that how about burglary how about uh, uh, car prowling or all grand theft auto all these type of things uh, sex offenses uh, all these uh, matters and issues you can search them by that if you're the uh, if you're the police department or the uh, sheriff's department or the uh, prosecution office and if these offices are not setting these police reports up in such a searchable database, well, what are we paying them for? Of course we expect them to be able to uh, <coughs> keep their information in a file like that and be able to search it and ask, it. how else do you find priors in, in a given suspect uh, with a given suspect? You've got to look it up. It's all part of, a, of a police detective work, part of the job as a, as a police officer. But... If the uh, police officers can do that, if the uh, sheriff's department, why not the public defenders? After all, they receive hundreds of these all the time in or hundreds of cases, these types of police reports. Why can't they uh, scan them in, or if they're already PDF, have them in their files and have them searchable by suspect, by officer, by this? So you're a public defender. You're representing Jack Wagon, the uh, defendant in this case and you know the two police officers <coughs> are Stone Wallingford and Juanita Kirkland so you go to the database and you do a search for Stone Wallingford and you get a stack of reports that Stone Wallingford wrote and you do the same for Juanita Kirkland and you get a stack of report, police reports that were authored by Juanita Kirkland now the cases may not be related to your case necessarily <coughs> but you get a stack of reports and a stack of narratives. Now, 
if they have this stack of narratives in there, then perhaps you can do a control F search or a keyword search for one particular word that police officers love to use in these things. And what word is that? It's the word ruse. R-U-S-E. Ruse? Well, it's a deception. A clever deception. That's what the word means. And what happens is, is that in a narrative, if you look real close, uh, let's see. In, in, I used in my second interview of a reporter, was a ruse indicating that there was a DVD recording of the incident or some such thing like that. Okay? So, he says there's a DVD recording of the incident. He was lying to the witness, lying to the person. And he said he was lying. And he signs the statement under penalty of perjury. So, either he was lying when he wrote the statement as, when he, as he says he did to the citizen, or he was lying when he signed under penalty of perjury. Now, I suspect it's far more likely that he was lying to the citizen as he says he did. That's part of his investigation. He lies to citizens. And other lies that police officer can tell in there is, is that they go in there, well, Mr. Smith, are you in there? Yeah, I am. What do you want? Well, we just want you to come out and talk. Yeah? You got a warrant? No, we don't have a warrant. We just want to talk. And Mr. Smith comes on out, and they put the cuffs on him because, of course, they had a warrant. They lied about the warrant. And not only did they lie about the warrant, they probably get a commendation for effecting the, uh, the arrest with a minimum of violence and property destruction because they got him out and they were able to put the cuffs on him, take him in without breaking down doors and all that, all that, kind, of a, all that kind of stuff. So you can understand why they do it. But here's the thing. All this, uh, all this self-admitted testimony, I fail to see why, under these, prior, under these, uh, under these uh, court decisions, if the credibility is crucial to the case, why this type of evidence, police reports, cannot be in, cannot be entered in on cross-examination to affect the purpose of the hearsay rule. Now, where did I put that? I know it's one of these in here somewhere. Ah! Uh-oh. Lost track of it. There it is. On this evidence rule. Because it goes to their truthfulness and untruthfulness. If they lie to citizens in the performance of their duty, why shouldn't the jury consider that in their credibility determinations? Because after all, the key jury instruction in every ca criminal case is, where is it? They're the sole judges of the credibility of the witness and how much weight to give their testimony. That's where it is. So folks, if public defenders such as the Associated Counsel for the Accused and the Northwest Defenders Association and other such association were to do what I am suggesting here, this can have a thunderclap effect on the way criminal justice is practiced, the way criminal law is practiced in this state and this nation. Probably as not, maybe not as big as, say, Gideon versus Greenway and uh, Miranda versus Arizona, but it would have quite an effect. Police would have to clean up their act if they want to be credible on the witness stand. This whole business of engaging in ruses, lying to citizens as part of their investigations, is, well, you know, it's one of the reasons people don't trust the police. So that's what, what I would suggest, is that this is something that doesn't require a big change in public policy, just a change in defense tactics. Be aggressive. It's your job to be aggressive. Represent your clients. If a prosecution case is dependent on the credibility of police officers, then get all their old re police reports and find out how many times they said they engaged in a ruse. How can a cop say he didn't engage in a ruse when he wrote a, in a police report and signed under a penalty of perjury saying he engaged in a ruse? 